tightest one in verse 4. Uh, as you can see, we're not exactly rushing through this opening bit of Titus, and there are reasons for that. Um, Titus is laying down things uh, that are going to be, he's laying down principles and ideas and stuff, that are going to be picked up very much in the body of the epistle. So the way he starts off very much comports with what comes later, the main points that he's going to be making at more length later in the letter. But he's laying down things now, right from the start, right in the greeting, that are going to be significant later as we work into the book. And I guess the biggest and clearest take home today is this. Um, he goes something like this. Christian, it is okay to be happy and helped. It is okay to be blessed by God and to live in the light of that. It's fine. We can smile. That's going to be okay. It is okay if God is richly blessing his people. It's okay to be happy. Now, it is very easy to get into the mindset of uh, being very uh, sober and serious and that we'll always be suffering and uh, feeling pain. You know, which, yeah, well, that, that's, we live in a fallen world, okay? We should be bearing that in such a way that the grace of God becomes evident again to us day by day. Fair enough. But it's, you know, we've got to break this sort of mold that says, oh, I'm so afflicted. You know, that's got to go. Because that doesn't speak to us actually about the truth that, that God pulls his grace into complexity, our complexity, day by day by day by day. And our testimony of the world is not, oh yes, we're Christians, we're suffering, it's bad. Well, our testimony of the world is, yeah, it's pretty rough sometimes. I couldn't do it without it. Does, does that make sense? Am I, am I communicating the difference here? Here's Titus dealing with absolute rubbish on the island of Crete. He's not having a very good time of it. You know, his ministry is not richly uh, rewarded, uh, appreciated. Um, you know, he has many who oppose him, so it appears, from what we read later, right? It's okay. It's fine. Keep calm. Live in the grace of God. Paul is definitely writing to overburdened, battle-weary Titus, and it's as if he's almost given him permission from the start to, to, to be okay. Titus is this storm-battered rock, you know, he's a rock of a guy, we've seen him, we'll see a bit more in a minute, but we've seen some of the stuff he's done, <coughs> he's a rock, and he's being shaken a bit, because the, the, the storms are blowing, and everybody's in that position. When they come against you, they rock you a bit, especially if they're not the people you'd expect. You know, we expect the people in the open air, or whatever, whenever we're doing some sort of outreach, we expect them to have a crack at us, we expect people who are sort of pagans, and you know, Whatever, it's not a crack of this, and, and militant Buddhists, you know, we've got some of them in Did you know we've got militant Buddhists? Amazing! Great! The richness of human life in this place. But, but yeah, you think, but anyway. Um, so, yeah, you know, that's fine. You expect to be having to deal with that, but it's not, that's not where the real problems arise, is it? It's when those who should be with us are not. Those who should be for us or against us. And Titus has got that on Crete in big style, as we'll see in the weeks. Battle scarred, storm battered Titus. And what Paul does for the man from the start in this letter is to express their this world transcending family links. We're the family of God together. We're in this together. He stresses their shared heart in a common faith. He prays that grace and peace, peace from God the Father and Jesus the Saving Lord will flood into Titus. going to transcend it. God is pleased to have his people's experience of life transcended like that. To take us out of ourselves. Yeah. Heading somewhere. With somebody. It's worth it. God is pleased to see his children in that position. Whoever they are. And Titus certainly wasn't your standard godly bloke. According to Paul's own historic pattern of thinking, Paul's background would not have seen Titus as your average godly boy. Far from that. To Titus, he writes, My true son, in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. So the main thing he's trying to communicate is grace and peace. Now, you can have grace and peace, Titus, because you're my true son in our common faith. Here's where we get it from. From God the Father and Christ Jesus our Saviour. That's what it's bound to. 
we get that. Because of that, and these words come in front come from God Himself. Wow. To me. Utterly impossible for Saul the Pharisee to say that to a man like Titus the Gentile in the days before the gospel of truth rocked Titus' own deck. And there are people on Crete who are troubling the church with their elitist Judaizing teachings. And Paul, one time Saul, his family name, the Pharisee, is writing to that situation. He's out Jew them all, if you see what I mean. He's out religious to a lot of them. And he's saying, Titus, Gentile dog that you are. Can you imagine the band in the Apostolic Band? It must be brilliant. Titus, you Gentile dog, you're my true son in our common faith. Tough on those Judaizers. They're going to be scandalised by every single word of this. Tough on them. My true son. My true son. In our common faith. Our common faith. Grace and peace to you. From God the Father and Christ Jesus our Saviour. And here's the servant of God. Apostle of Jesus Christ. Administering the grace to Gentile and Jew. That the old promises of the Old Testament contain. And are now fulfilled in Christ. This indiscriminate gospel that set Paul's heart on fire. That got him out of bed every morning. Kept him going through shipwrecks and beatings. It will do so for you. And it touches the past. It touches the past before time. And it touches the future. God's future beyond time in the other direction. And you have a part in its revelation. As I do, says Paul. These are things that were written times before and now they come through from the gospel I preach. Right? They did that before. Proclaim Christ, he says. Nothing else is ever going to be so significant as proclaiming Christ. For these reasons. It makes people like you and me in this relationship because of the grace of God that he's given to us in the gospel. Okay, Titus then, who are we dealing with? Who's he talking about? Um, <clears throat> Titus is referred to 12 times in the New Testament. He was a Greek boy. And it looks as, you know, Paul circumcised Timothy, but he didn't circumcise Titus. It looks as if Titus remained uncircumcised as a test case for the grace-based gospel amongst the Gentiles. Galatians 2, 3. So there's Titus, there's a living demonstration to the Judaizers on Crete that it wasn't necessary for Gentile believers to obey the works of the Jewish law to be put right with God. There's a test bed. Titus is the man. He's Paul's partner in sorting out all sorts of difficult, difficult situations. Uh, that immoral church in Achaia, at Corinth, who was there so in that, a trading place, a port with a godless and colourful nightlife. It was Titus who was called on to step into that situation, into the problems that arose there, over the collection for the Jerusalem church during the famine. That went a bit, so Titus was sent. Uh, and then there were tensions that arose between Paul and the Corinthian church when Paul tried to sort of discipline the immorality in the Corinthian church, which was scandalising even the scandalous people of Corinth. He sent Titus to try and deal with that because he'd written a letter and they all got shirty. Titus is the guy who's sent. And now Titus is getting left on Crete as the seasoned fixer of churches gone haywire. We need guys like that. To sort out the problems on Crete, to appoint elders who will safeguard the church's future. How will they do that? The point of an elder is that he's there to teach the Bible. He's there to teach the Bible. From Acts 6, you've got people there who are the servants of the church, they are the elected servants of the church, the deacons, and they are there to take care of the money, and they are there to take care of the caring ministries of the church. And you've got the guys who mustn't be compromised with that, mustn't compromise their teaching ministry with that, because it does get in a tangle, and if there's a problem with that, then it's going to cause it, and they don't listen to the word, and if they don't listen to the word, everything's lost. The church isn't fed, and things go bad. So he's there on Crete to sort out things that have gone bad by putting in place the people who will be responsible for teaching the word of God. Every elder must be apt to teach the back of us. It means he's going to be able to do that. And you're there to appoint them, Titus. 
So he's the guy from the tight corner, as we've seen before. And once he's done that, Paul asks Titus to go on to Nicopolis. Nicopolis is from Corinth. Nicopolis is on up the sort of Greek sort of world. Um, here's Athens, Corinth, Athens. Nicopolis is on up that northern seaboard up towards Italy, up towards Rome, as it were. And he goes on up here, and then he goes up to Dalmatia, which is here. In 2 Timothy, it says, and he goes on up there. Um, I'm going to work up there. Yeah, 2 Timothy 4.10 is up in Dalmatia, which of course is, um, is what we know as Bosnia Herzegovina. Uh, he's on up that way. Which is quite interesting, isn't it? Off he goes. To Titus, that guy. My true son. Now, there's a father working with his son at the bench. It's not going to do with this. It is not that long since Jewish Christians would not sit down at the same meal as Gentile Christians. That's fresh. It's not that long since Acts 15, the Council of Jerusalem, and sorting out the whole issue of table fellowship, actually accepting somebody. You know, we have it in our culture, don't we? Somebody comes around for a meal and we know we're accepted and we feel accepted and that's good. <clears throat> it's been great recently. A few people coming out of the, um, the things we did in the pub around Christmas time. They drop by for a cup of tea. It's been great. No, they do that. Yeah, you know, someone dark night, somebody walking past, knock knock, come in, come on, have a cup of tea. Yeah. That little leaf. Great stuff. Well, it's not that long since Jewish people would not sit down and have a cup of tea yeah. with Gentile Christians. You are my true son, he says. Wow, what? That is that is mind blowing. We've lost that stunned, being stunned by that. True son, you're my true. It's not uncommon, of course, now for Paul, gospel enlightened Paul, to speak of individuals on his team like that. You get the 1 Timothy 1 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Saviour, and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith. No problem with that. 2 Timothy 1 2. Paul, apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son. We say, oh, yes, spiritually, you must have led him to the Lord. Hang on, hang on, slow down. We're God's sons by that process. What's going on? You get that sort of language in Philippians 2.22. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I've no one else like him, that's Timothy, okay, who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because... As a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. What's going on? Hope they would send him as soon as I see how he's going. He served with me in the work of the gospel like a father works with his son. What's in Paul's mind? Now we know what's in our minds. Son, you know, generation, he's my spiritual child. You know, don't know how that works. That's not, don't know about that. Paul is saying, hey, there's this relationship, like a father-son working relationship here. He's worked like an apprentice at my bench. Paul seems to have, in this son language, he seems to at least, sometimes he seems to have the idea of the way someone has been properly trained as a craftsman in God's work, like a son beside his father's bench. And the idea of having been trained this way to do a proper job of teaching the Bible and discipling the church, that seems to crawl up again in 1 Corinthians 4. This is not just a one-off. I'm writing this not to shame you, but to warn you, as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, my son, whom I love, son again, right? Who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. There's this link between my son and the faithfulness of the message. There's something about being a true son tied up in all of this, that, that understanding that he who works with me in the gospel work is like a father apprentice to his son learning the trade, the way, the way no doubt Jesus was apprenticed to Joseph and learned carpentry. 
compare it with uh, the book of Philemon, Philemon 10. Paul indicates to Philemon he should receive an SMS back because Philemon was working alongside Paul, learning the gospel trade before getting sent back to Colossae to make his peace with Philemon. Certainly compatible with the way Peter uses the term in 1 Peter 5. It's not just Paul. 1 Peter 5, talking about Mark. Now, Mark was in Rome with Peter. Right? And Mark learned the things he wrote down for us in Mark's Gospel from Peter in Rome. Paul called, Peter called it Babylon, but it, it's code for Rome, right? Because in Rome, the centre of the evil empire, right? My son, he says, my son Mark. He's been here working with me in the Gospel work. He's learned the stuff, he's gone off and he's written the Gospel. The point is that relationship of father-son apprenticeship learning in the craft. That's son. Here in Titus, it is more than that. It is not just that he's properly learned the trade and knows what he's doing. It is, he is my true son in our common faith. And the emphasis has been, again, put twice, as it were, on the authenticity of what Titus is teaching, on the authenticity of his message, because he's trained in this way, alongside the authenticated apostles. Is that making sense? How are we preparing people for gospel ministry? Here's what we do. We send them off to a pseudo-academic institution. My true son has worked alongside me, truly apprenticed, time served, authentic minister of the word is Titus. And that word true, Gnesios, means genuine. It had previously been used of legitimate as opposed to illegitimate children. And it's used of the legitimate or, or authentic interpreters of political philosophers' teaching. So Aristotle interpreting Plato, it's used of that, that's the authentic interpretation of the message of, of, of uh, Plato. And again, that kind of understand, undergirds his understanding of son here. Titus has served as an apprenticeship with Paul in the service of the gospel. He's a craftsman. The authenticity of, of his truth is, is irreproachable. Because he's a properly time-served apostle of God. <clears throat> Our job as a church here needs to be doing that sort of job. is a red herring, but it's kind of a red herring. Does that make sense? I don't know. It is a bit of a red herring, but it is kind of a red herring. Recently, a really good guy put on Twitter something about, you know, um, God's plans and purposes in this world are achieved through church planting. And I kind of posted a, are you sure? Because it seems to me that what Jesus wants to happen is for us to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. So we are to go and make disciples of people. And as we do that, as Jesus went and did that, what happened was the church. Jesus preached the kingdom, but it was the church that came. And the kingdom's coming in the church. But, but the point is, he is preaching discipleship following Christ, right? And what happens is the church. So if we go out there looking to happen the church, it's not really happening the church, because that's not how he happens the church. And we're going to get focused on something that is not the primary plan and purpose of God, which is for us to go and make disciples of other people. Our job as a church here needs to be doing that job, taking guys and apprenticing them. That's discipleship, apprenticeship, that's how it goes. Uh, you know, a discipleship is a spiritual apprenticeship, isn't it? Does that, does that make sense? That's how the church gets planted, that's how the church gets built, when its people are doing this discipling others to Christ. Showing them the Christian way to live this thing they're doing. Titus has been apprenticed to me. He is therefore my true son in our common faith. Our common faith. And under that comes guys like Titus, solid bloke, reliable, true son of the apostle in their shared faith. Did you know there's been recently, this last week, weekend? This last weekend? This weekend. Hmm. A conference in London on masculinity. Excellent. Marvelous. Because there's a consciousness that, you know, men post-feminism are very confused about what they should be. As you can see, I'm riddled with angst. Right? Um, so, so they've had this conference. Now, it's important. A lot of guys are, you know, a lot of young fellows really are. They don't have to be what they're supposed to be. That's part of it. 
and, and I, I heard a report of it on Radio 4, and it said, uh, it was marvellous, the keynote address was given by Grayson Perry. Do you know Grayson Perry? He, he turned up for the Queen to give, he's an artist, he turned up for the, for the Queen to give him his, I don't know, some award or other, dressed as a woman. I mean, he, he, he goes around dressed as a woman, he does his hair purple and his lipstick and his dresses, he loves his dress. This is the guy addressing a conference on masculinity. Guys, guys are a bit lost and they don't know what they need to be. So that when you arrange a conference on being what a man ought to be, you have Grace and Perry telling him that they need to be in touch with their emotions and, and they need to be able to say that they don't know and they have, I'm sorry. Strengths of he's a character and a half, right? But we've lost our way. We live in a world that is ripe for discipleship training. My true son in our common faith says, Paul of Titus. He has worked alongside me, as it were, the way Timothy did, and he's a bit of a rock. My true son, then, Titus, my true son, in our common faith. Again, this is crazy. Uncircumcised Gentile Titus. Common faith, true son. Bungus stuff. What's going on? Well, of course, what's happening in the back of all this is... Paul is authenticating the faith that Titus is establishing on Crete, right? It is the authentic stuff. It is, we have it in common. It is the right job, because I'm the right apostle, and you know that. And he's authenticating what Titus is doing. There's not a lot of authenticating of younger men's ministry around us. Now, that young men are being trained is unfortunate at the moment. But the young men that are coming forward largely, largely seem to be unfortunate moment because they're not being trained for the future they are going to have to contend with in terms of the way things are going in our society in our world at the moment. But look, Paul is taking a guy who is on the right lines, who has been trained adequately properly, who is an authentic communicator of the gospel, and he's authenticating what he's doing. He's saying, that's good. This is our common faith that we're talking about. He's getting behind this fellow. This guy's faith is my faith, the authentic faith, as you would expect of a true son who's learned the faith alongside me in the workshop of the Gentile mission. How, how was Paul trained people? In the workshop of the Gentile mission. Let's give me some evangelism. A policeman said to me recently, um, he has sort of, he has a little role for mentoring a little bit with young fellas, and uh, he said, every now and again there'll be some new lads turn up or the two turns up at this station, he'll, he'll leave it to the afternoon and he'll, he'll, well, he'll say, uh, right, put your hat on, and he'll put his big hat on, and we did. We're going for a walk. What, what do you mean? Going for, we're going for a walk. Got a car. We're going for a walk. Here's how Paul was trained guys like Timothy and Titus. And those guys he's now sending off around the place. He's seen some quality in them, he's seen something in them, he's perceived something of the call of God. And he's gone, have they learned? They've gone for a walk. They've gone for a walk into the Agora, the marketplace. They've gone for a walk into the synagogue. Ooh, yeah, that's been good. And they, they've gone in all sorts of places like that, and they trained them like that. They have not sat them in the classroom. Filled their heads with books. It's easy. It's too easy. They've gone for a walk. Now, come on, who can we take on like that? Because it's not just guys, it's, it's, it's girls too. Girls are confused about where to go and what to do. True son, common faith. This is our faith that we have learned, and you have learned with me, in the workshop of the Gentile mission. And we know that there are Judaizers on Crete, trying to lead people away from the authentic testimony of the gospel. There are religious people who are trying to fill people's minds with a religion that will kill them for eternity. Paul said, that's rubbish. This is the there's a need for doing that, isn't there? For clarifying people's perception. That is nonsense. This is right. Our faith that you and I hold in common, Titus. We're together in this faith which places all feet on the level ground at the foot of the cross. Because Paul means what he writes in Romans 3. When he says there is no difference, Jew or Greek, 
slave nor Scythian, bond nor free. When he writes there in Romans 3, there's no difference whether Jew or Greek, and man, there were some pre existing pre gospel differences between those two groups. Here are the big levels then. All have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. That's the first big level of all people. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Those are the levels. We have this in common. We have this common faith together, you and I. Different worlds, worlds apart. We hold this authentic faith in common. But both those key points in it also put us on the level ground, both at the foot of the cross and at the steps of his throne in glory. In a world so radically divided between Jew and Gentile, Greek and barbarian, depending on your perspective. A world where the racial discrimination common to life pre-Christ was being dragged back into relationships in the church. In that world, Paul writes the uncircumcised Gentile, Titus, and he says, our common faith. And that is dangerously socially radical. Wouldn't it be great if we could get a multinational of young people to come and help us in a place like Llanfair. All colours, please. Wouldn't that be great? That would start some discussion. We're all the same under the skin, boys. Dangerously socially radical, but a crucial testimony to what God has done and is doing through Jesus. It's a really important testimony of the gospel because all that stuff in Joel 2, you know, but it's the universality in Joel 2. Everyone gets sort of hung up on the spirit coming and all the rest of it. Yeah, but it's been poured out on all flesh. And, and Acts 2 is all about all flesh because people from all around the Roman world heard him speaking in their own languages. They called to worship God. Let's see some of that Sorry, let me move on. Time's wrong. Titus. Here's the blessing. Grace and peace. Okay. I'm not going to rush peace, okay? I'm going to do peace next week. Is that okay? Because we know about grace. I'm just going to cover it. But peace is really important. Really important. Sorry, Tom. You don't have to get it. It'll be on the web. <laughs> It'll be on the web, Tom. Yeah, you can send a message back and tell me where I've got it wrong, okay? Paul's blessing of Titus just sums up what all Christians need. Here's what we need. What do you need today? You have things to pray about. We've got a list of things we want to be praying about. What do you need? The grace and peace of God to deal with that in your life. Paul telling Titus the essence of what all Christians need in this blessing, from whom they receive it, and in what capacity the members of the Godhead stand to us as individual Christians. Grace then. What's grace? A little lad who's recently sort of made some sort of commitment to Jesus comes along to you and he says, uh, what's this grace business? What are you going to say? I was that lad. And it took me a very long time to find somebody who could give me an answer that was at all satisfying. It took a long time. It's one of those words we use. The, uh, the little old guy who was the first church secretary I ever had, uh, you know, in my own ministry, uh, as opposed to his assistant, um, God's riches at Christ's expense. <laughs> okay, that's great, that's fantastic. The unmerited favour of God. More than that. Here's what we do deserve, and we don't get it. I really deserve it. And here's what we don't have, but need gives it to us instead. Throughout Paul's theology, grace represents the action of God that sees the just deserts of, of sinful and rebellious human beings not being given them, but instead of that, they are being given what they really don't deserve. Unmerited favour of God. And you know, the hard thing is some people simply cannot accept it because their pride won't let them. Their pride won't let them. 
There was a situation yesterday where <coughs> David was a young man had a plaque that he brought back from America, which had the, the John Deere tractor symbol on it, and underneath it said, runs like a deer. Caleb knows that's really precious to David. David was tidy that and his life has moved on. He's a dad now, you know, he's got his own problems. And uh, he was going to throw this up. He said, Caleb, have that. And it was almost too precious for Caleb to take. Do you know what I mean? And, and actually, Caleb left without it. I brought it back. <laughs> but it's just too precious to take. You can't accept. So many people in that position. Pride keeps people from the grace of God. Because it's, it's having to have what we cannot earn, what we do not deserve, which is the opposite of what we deserve. Grace to you. Live in that. Bathe in that. Swim in that sea. God can do that. And he can do that whilst being just. That, that he can be just because he punished sin on my son and then give what the son has deserved to us. By the voluntary interaction of the God. Jesus betrayed at the hands of men, bearing the injustice as well as the physical, emotional, spiritual pain of that accursed death on the cross. Is somebody being unjust? To you? To me? Not fair. Not as that. Look at that. Teaches us how Jesus Christ bore the unjust punishment of my sin against him voluntarily, so that his perfect record with God could be set to my sinner's account. My account. And Paul goes on to teach that Christ was raised from the dead on the third day, demonstrating the price of sin, which is death, had been fully paid up by Jesus, so now he was alive again. And that he, Paul, had seen this Jesus shining with the heavenly glory of the Son of Man of Daniel 7 as he walked down the road to Damascus. That son of man in Daniel 7 who comes into the heavenly court and takes up his cosmic role as he sits down on the throne of the Ancient of Days, the ruling throne of God, and that Jesus, contrary to what I deserve, saves sinful men. Live in that grace. How are you feeling on, on Crete Titus? Are you feeling a bit battered, boy? Look at the grace of God for you. Look at the privilege that's been given you. And we get thumped and battered and blown around. Of course we do. Sometimes because we're trying to do what God wants us to do. Look at that boy. We need Titus. That grace. It's grace. That free unmerited grace. Because in our sin none of us is able to help ourselves. We're shot through and through with sin. We can't help ourselves. But more than just have it. We need to live in that grace. And bathe in that grace. And enjoy that grace. Because otherwise we're going to get miserable people. In the church. Now that, that's going to be great, isn't it? Having a bunch of really unblessed feeling people in the... It's not going to work. From the turmoil that sin brings us, this grace and living on it. Living, enjoying that. 